Hello and welcome back to the Purpose Over Profit podcast. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about language and specifically the impact of language, learning languages uh, on kids. And if I think back to when I was younger learning French, at, I think it was high school before we, we got a language, um, there was a real old school mentality about it. It was, you know, are you going to go and live in France or what use is a, you know, Spanish going to do you? Um, it's going to help you on holiday, but, you know, in terms of impact and, and uh, on your career, it's not really that useful, is it? And I think that was a real shame. So certainly as an adult, I now appreciate, and as a dad, I appreciate the impact that language has on, I guess, how we learn. Um, and actually, there's a, we talk about it in this episode, there's a sweet spot around, you know, when kids are younger, that they are just like sponges. And it really helps them, yes, pick up languages uh, and learn languages, there's a benefit in and of themselves, but it actually helps you to learn and socialise and also be more appreciative of different cultures as well. So our guest this week, Louise Linehan, is um, is a teacher of modern languages. She has multiple businesses, works with both children and adults to help them, um, particularly in Spanish and French. And yeah, we kind of dive into a bit of a conversation around how she managed to get into that field, uh, what were her ambitions uh, f- from that as she was kind of growing up, um, and how does uh, what drives her just now? What's the passion behind what she does, um, and what are the benefits that um, can be there for both children and adults by learning languages? So I think it's a fantastic episode. There's lots in it for you. Certainly, if you're a parent, I would say listen in. Um, there's lots to take away from here, and I'm sure you're going to love it. Hi Louise, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here. How are you? Hi, yeah, thanks very much for inviting me along. Uh, yeah, I'm doing good today, you guys. Yeah, cannot cannot complain. I'm I'm really going to be hoping that all the sanding's been done. We're just not long into our new house. So the painters have told me it's just the paint going onto the walls now. So I'm hoping to not have any really any distractions. Um but yeah, so Louise, obviously I like I know you because you teach or you don't personally teach, but you're, you're, uh, one of your businesses, Kids Lingo, that you're affiliated with is, um, you know, helps my, my daughter, helps my, my son, Lauren and Murray, um, try to learn some French, to be honest. Yes. And it's something that Sensibly. I've always been keen to try and get that, um, get them involved in that at a young age. But I know obviously you're involved in languages with adults as well. So do you want to maybe just give us a bit of an introduction as to who you are and a bit about your background, what you do? Yeah, uh of course. So yeah, um, you said try to teach French, but yeah, we do. It goes in, it does go in. I know, that sounded like it was almost a a criticism on on, on the teaching. It's it's more for the attention span, I think, of my kids, to be honest. That's it. No, so yeah, um, well, languages is all I ever remember. One of my very earliest memories I have is being in holiday with my parents in Spain and uh, sitting at the at the table in the restaurant, listening to the waiters speaking and just being absolutely fascinated by the noise and the sounds coming out of their mouths. And this, I mean, I'm talking, I must have been preschool age and it just blew my mind. And it's one of my very earliest memories. And for as long as I can remember, all I've ever wanted to do was to learn how to speak languages. So that very much kind of directed my education career all the way through kind of secondary school and my choices that I made. Um, I started learning Spanish in first year, took up French in third year. And then when I graduated, I went to Strathclyde University and was advised um, not to just do pure languages. So I actually, my degree is in international business with uh, Spanish and French, specialised in marketing, um, international marketing um, at honours level. So part of that, I got to spend a year studying in Spain and a year in France, which was just brilliant for obviously my language development and just an absolute riot of a time, (laughs) which is great. Um, And after graduating, I I haven't always been a teacher, believe it or not. So after graduating, I went into financial services sector and worked um, in banking, including a stint working for Santander Bank in the south of Spain, um, helping 
mainly criminals, to be honest, buy holiday homes in Spain. <laughs> so yeah, that, that was what I did first when I came out of uni. And um, yeah, I came back to the UK and uh, retrained as a teacher. I didn't think I was going to enjoy teaching. I just knew I needed to come back to the UK for a period of time and didn't want to lose languages. Uh, my other half suggested teaching. I laughed at him, said I don't like kids. No. But I knew the minute, um, you know, the bell rang on my first teaching placement that this is what I was meant to do. It just felt right. And so I taught in secondary schools for um, 10, 11 years. My last position was as I headed department of a modern languages department here in East Kilbride. And at that point, we had kids and was looking for something for a bit more work-life balance. So Kids Lingo fell into my lap at that point. And now I'm in my fifth year of Kids Lingo. And we just came up for three years in my adult language business as well. So yeah, kind of windy path, but still all the way through it, it's just my languages. I couldn't imagine doing anything else other than uh, working with Spanish and French for all of my days to be honest it never grows old for me so well, interesting yeah. so interesting was, i never no, on you go chris sorry i was going to just say i love that because i, I actually know somebody else who studied language as well i can't remember the girl, I think it was kerry and she done international business as well and ah, she, right. she moved to spain as well and she absolutely loved it she loved living the life of spain i think she was there for a year and a half and then she moved to a different mm-hmm. country and she said that experience herself just gave her so much more cultural awareness and she found it tremendous it's, it is absolutely so. I um, was taking the mic to be honest with you, but as part of our degree, you had to spend a year abroad. So that was your um, fourth year, but you could also go away in the third year as well. And I just thought, oh, I'm going to go. That's it. So <laughs> two years in Glasgow, a year in Paris, a year in Granada, and then back home for the honours year. So, um, but yeah, in terms of your cultural awareness, is you have you know you go over there, you experience it, you're dropped right into the middle of it. So you have to kind of embrace the lifestyle around about you. And without a doubt, obviously, your language development is incredibly um, fast at that particular point in time. You can only get to a certain point in language learning, I believe anyway, in the UK, and you kind of plateau and you almost have to drop yourself into that environment for it really to start to pick up again and and get to that level of real fluency. but yeah, a brilliant experience of studying abroad and not just meeting Spanish and French people, but students from all across the world who I'm still in touch with nowadays. And it's interesting that you'd said it was almost like destined right from the very, like, you know, earliest memories. You're going, yeah, languages for me, this is so, so interesting. And it's kind of tracked you right through. But I was keen, the fact that you you know, you were kind of advised not to focus just on languages. So you picked up your degree in um, specialising in marketing and international business. I think what made you move into finance? Like it sounds like I'm really interested. I, I didn't expect to be digging yeah. into, um, you know, illegal activities, trading activities in the south of Spain, but um, <laughs> on, on this podcast. Yeah. But but um, but like what, what attracted you to that? Because I, I would almost maybe unfairly would have thought teaching must have came on your your came into your, your your kind of mind at some point prior to that move um or, or yeah, did it? well do you know it was a bit of a kind of, kind of fell into finance I think is probably the better way of explaining it so as part of my when I was studying my undergraduate degree in Glasgow I used to work yeah. part-time for the RBS so I worked for RBS for a number of years so felt quite comfortable with that kind of environment, but it wasn't the numbers, it was the relationship management. So it was the people. And that was kind of what I really enjoyed about the job uh, first and foremost. So, and really, I don't know if you both were in a similar situation, certainly back in the era where I graduated university, you had been led to believe that university made, it opened loads of doors and you would just be handed that ideal job at the end of your honours so you're both nodding like yeah <laughs> and you know I spent so much time in my honours year grappling with what I wanted to do and applying for these graduate positions which were a job in their own right with exams and all this sort of stuff. so really to be deadly honest it was availability of a job that allowed me to at least be in Spain again and using my languages and that idea of working in a kind of a customer facing or relationship management type role that I really liked about it and 
of course, yeah, I, I was on a plane within a few weeks and off I went to the south of Spain. So you can't, you know, whether that was my dream career and the sector I wanted to go into, not entirely sure. Obviously it wasn't, you know, but um, it was it was an attractive prospect for me to get myself back to Spain, which was kind of my priority at that point. Um, and yeah, I enjoyed that experience. It was great. I met some interesting people I think is probably the word <laughs> I can say um, and I had a great I had, yeah I had a great time but I just knew my heart wasn't entirely in it um, and unfortunately maybe that's not the right word to use I had met a guy from Glasgow in my honours year and I kind of liked him so I thought I'll maybe come back and see what happens here 16 years late three kids I know I was going to say I really later. hope that at this point I'll I hope that's husband you're talking about <laughs> I hope this isn't him just finding out so <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, and, and what is it how hard is it because obviously everyone's got different dialects not dialects different regional differences in their voice and their tone I mean Darren's from Fife so you can tell his accent as well how is it in Spain and all these kind of countries is there kind of local yeah. dialect and local slang you have to kind of get used to uh, yeah absolutely 100% so um, if you imagine the distance between Glasgow and Edinburgh is like less than an hour and there's a massive change in the dialect you think how huge Spain is Um in Spain, you also have not just kind of accents, you also have regional languages, a bit like how we have Gaelic in Scotland. So, you know, you have Skira and Valenciano, and there's actual distinct languages according to certain regions in Spain. But the accents, oh my gosh, yes, the accents are so varied. It's incredible. So the area where I lived and did my uni year was in Granada, which is in the south of Spain and Andalusia, so right down the bottom of Spain. And it, all I can explain, it would be like learning English like proper English and then coming to Glasgow for a year abroad being like oh my gosh so yeah I spent the first couple of months in Spain thinking this what is going on they don't pronounce the s or the d and so it took a long time just to kind of get my ear tuned in but then which is great when you live there for a long time you then adopt that accent yourself so when I speak to native Spaniards they're like you've lived in the south of Spain haven't you because they can hear that I've picked up that accent while I've been there. So, yeah, that is, is great. But challenging all in its own right, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can imagine, like, I guess we kind of maybe think it's unique to something like the UK that we've got these different dialects or, you know, you know, Liverpool or Mank or whatever it is, like, different areas of the UK. But actually, like, why would that not be the same everywhere else? Totally. I mean, we have a link just now with them. Um, so Speech Bubble is linked up with the sister school in Argentina just now. So obviously in Argentina, they speak Spanish, but myself and my students have been really actually quite blown away by how different that accent is. Um, our adult students and the students over there who are learning English, we do kind of virtual language exchanges together. And yeah, even myself with many years of experience speaking Spanish, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I have to really concentrate to know to try and understand what they're saying. But it is, it's that lovely change. It's great. That's what's beautiful about language, isn't it? It's really lovely. And I guess in Granada as well, how did they take to a Scottish girl coming over and living there for a year? Did they, did they absolutely love it as well? Yeah, do you know, um, it's a university city. So, do you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, incoming uh, foreign students Uh I spent a lot of my time in Granada actually with Spanish people, French people, Italian people, that international student community kind of tended to group together really rather than integrate with the locals for whatever expression. And in um, Granada there's a massive Moroccan population as well which was great because I got to speak a lot of French in Granada as well. I had a lot of um, friends who were from Algeria and stuff so we I got to speak a lot of French there too but um, yeah, very welcoming and used to that beautiful multicultural environment in Granada. Um, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. And has it always been? Is it French and Spanish? I guess that you've that you've mainly focused on. Is there other languages that you've you kind of piqued your interest? Or I have dabbled in a bit of German um, at school, and I like. This is just my sad way of thinking but I do study a bit of Latin in my own All spare right. time she says but that's mainly because I'm really interested in etymology and the source of language and where words come from and obviously with Spanish and French they have that Latin link so yeah I'm fascinated with when I see 
uh, Latin patterns and vocabulary and grammar. And I'm like, oh, there it is. That's the Spanish or that's the French. And yeah, so that's just my own little um, hobby, so to speak. It's, I'm not going to bump into somebody that I can speak Latin with, you know, so <laughs> it's just like, really challenging, I think. I love that as well because my wife, my wife spoke German at school and she does, does a little, but not a lot. And I love even working uh, in brand as well. So it's all about language. And it's if you put a piece of content out. Frozen. Oh, he's frozen. Yeah. Oh, he's frozen there. Are you back, Chris? It's unbelievable. You I just froze. Oh, I just froze. Oh, apologies. I go go and uh, go and say that again. I think I, I lost you after the uh, Debbie. She's done a bit oh, of German, okay. not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. So Debbie studied Ger- uh, German as well at school, and she's very passionate about language. She loves it because they're so passionate whenever they're speaking. It sounds quite aggressive at times, but they're just so yeah. engaged. So we're loving it as well. And I love as well whenever you get something translated into the German language because I work in brand and advertising. Something that can be small context and words for English turns into a large spiel for the German language because they love to just put so many uh, syllables behind stuff as well, which I absolutely love. Absolutely. So, I'd, lo- I'd love to hear a bit of Latin as well at some point. So is there any Latin? Oh, <laughs> I don't think you get a bit of Latin. Latin's a bit of the scary thing. But, do you know, having studied marketing, it is fascinating. International marketing in particular, like, we saw a lot of situations where the language doesn't translate and some actually some really funny um, issues where language doesn't translate. So I can't remember the brand of the car that made the Nova. Was it a Vauxhall? Vauxhall, yeah. Yes. yeah. Vauxhall. Yeah. So Vauxhall couldn't sell the car, the Nova in Spain because Nova in Spanish means doesn't go, which is not a good name for a car. So <laughs> There's a lot of stuff like that, you know, where we had the, an international market folk had to get their heads together and change things over. Um, even just the word Vauxhall, isn't, it's not Vauxhall in Spain, it's Opal. And that's purely because to ask a Spanish person to pronounce Vauxhall, they wouldn't even know where to begin um, because of the, the combination of the letters. So, yeah, there's some really great stories out there. There's some proper marketing faux pas to do with language. We've seen it the other way around, haven't we? I'd always was it is it Sif? It used to always be Jeff in the UK, but must have changed That's to right. Sif for maybe that 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 same reason. Maybe maybe to save on different regional brandings across the world. Oh, absolutely! There'll be a financial element there somewhere, no doubt. Yeah, you've always got to do your research. I can't remember. I'm not even going to say the company. Actually, it was a, a American company that launched that joined a French brand as well, and they launched some kind of new brand in France without really checking mm-hmm. with their French. Uh, uh, compatriots and it turned out the word they'd used was a slang for uh, women of the night in the red light district if you liked <laughs> uh, so, 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 yeah. so that's the power of social media as well. yeah exactly so get, I, I suppose getting back to um, languages I guess and the like your decision I guess to when you came back from from the south of Spain and, and kind of l- almost looking for something to do and having that suggestion about teaching what was it about teaching that you were like do you know what I'm not that that that, this isn't for this isn't for me what do you think was was kind of stopping you you from moving in there I should probably keep this on the down low but I think I've been in kids lingo now and people know I do like children I just thought I can't connect with kids like I was the youngest in my family and so never really had siblings or nieces or cousins or anything around about. So the concept of me kind of, you know, spending my day with children, I was a bit like, I don't even know how to connect with these young people. And actually um, it was, I thought, well, this is a route for me to, you know, gain another qualification. I'm just Let's just try it and we'll see how it goes. And with hindsight, I think, through my university career and my you know kind of work that I did do in the private sector I actually had so many transferable skills that made me absolutely perfect for teaching like my customer relationship management and my ability to present and to talk and to you know resolve conflicts and to take ideas and explain them so that people can understand and it just seemed to everything dropped into place and I think part of me was a bit like yeah, I can actually, this was actually quite a good idea. <laughs> you know, I felt really comfortable straight away. And at the end of the day, you know, having a customer relationship background, it's exactly what you do to be a successful teacher. You need to, it's not about the content. It's about that relationship that you have with 
the children and with the young people, with your students. It's, if you have that great relationship there and a good rapport, they're going to be open and able to learn with you. Um, and yeah, I think it was one of those things where I thought, I can't deal with kids. No, no, no. But it was really just about the relationships and being able to talk and get along with people from all walks of life and all backgrounds. Um, so, yeah. Do you think there's an age thing there in, as well? Like, I, I remember, Chris, I don't know if you, you, you came to any of these, but when we started mentoring with MCR Pathways, a kind of local charity in Glasgow, but they've kind of farmed out the, the support by putting mentors into schools and helping, you know, people that maybe not had the best start in life, but kind of trying to give them a bit of um, consistency, I guess, and, and, and guidance over a period of years. But I, I'd be talking to people in my workplace around, like, oh, you'd be a fantastic mentor. You've got so many skills that would be amazing. And actually just showing up for someone is, is really, really valuable and listening yeah. and developing a relationship with someone. These things are inherently valuable, but it felt like certainly, you know, say 25 and under, it felt like a really difficult message and people were coming up to me going, I, I don't think I'm qualified to do this. I don't think I'd be, I'd, I'd have anything to offer. And I found that just really strange and I just wonder whether was there a was there almost a maturity element to that 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 you kind of gained some experience you came a bit more confident in terms of what those skills were and who you were and what you could offer yeah I think um certainly youth has its benefits going into teaching um it it takes a lot of um energy physical energy and I think when you're saying about people under that kind of 25 age being unsure about their value, their worth, so to speak, to, to be a mentor or, or to work with children. I think that says something maybe more about them themselves and their own belief in what they may have achieved in their lives or what they think that they have to offer. I think it maybe comes down potentially, that's my own thoughts anyway, that. Darren, it's, you know, it comes down to them not believing that they could be and a mentor and could be an inspiration for somebody um I think it's maybe got a little bit to do with that and I think maybe as we grow older we become more secure in uh, our achievements and um our confidence in ourselves you know and I think that makes us potentially a little bit yeah more open to working and with I, th people. I think you're right and I think it's that like that feels it's a bit of a like it's quite a shame that like, that that, mm -hmm. that that is the case um, like I, I, get, I was going to say that, but I guess as well, there must be an experience where I mean, you've, you've probably seen it as well. I've seen life coaches out there, but the life coaches are 21 years old, and you're thinking, How yeah. can you be a life coach? You've not lived a bit of experience. I guess maybe at that age of under 25, there's that confidence that you haven't got that life experience yet, and you haven't yeah, tallied up a bit of life as well. Like, like you were saying, obviously, Louise, you've traveled the country, you've lived a bit of life, and you came home, you had the corporate life as well. So then you've got that, that's that experience of dealing, dealing with even the kind of more uh, dodgy folk, if you like, in, in Spain, looking for holiday homes Absolutely. and people Absolutely. in banks as well. So you get that life experience and you know how to handle yourself and handle all our relationships. And maybe you don't get Without that a doubt. from their yeah. age. There is totally this element that mm -hmm. I've, spoke, I've spoken before about it. Like maybe it's maybe it's wrong, but I kind of pick up the sense in, in Glasgow. And again, a lot of this maybe bias from my own experience, but this like suppressing confidence in, <laughs> in young people, yeah. suppressing like, you just wind your neck in there, you know, and and we kind of, we, we, you know, certainly in my own experience, I kind of, I was the other side, well over the other side of 30 before I started questioning some of that for myself. And I think it's a real <laughs> shame that that actually we should be, there should be more of an effort to kind of build our young people up to, to feel that yeah. confidence because they will find where their place in the world is a hell of a lot quicker if we kind of get out the road and let them do that. Yeah, I think also there's a lot of it comes down to our kind of national um, mentality. Maybe it's a, a, a British thing as well, where we don't shout about our achievements and we're not egotistical and loud and look at me, how amazing am I? We just don't do that. We're not comfortable with that. So obviously that's going to rub off on our children too. Do yeah. you know? so we, how how does that yeah, differ over in Spain? How does that differ, like Spain, France, like, like, is that different? Like, everyone always goes America, like, oh, yeah, we're we're not like America. That's we're, a bit too much. <laughs> yeah, Are they sit in the middle, Spain, France. I don't know. Yeah, I think there is a little bit of that too. Um, but certainly, going um, from most of the time I lived in Spain, actually, children are um, embraced as a as a part of the family that 
should be seen and should be heard Lovely. and you don't adapt your your lifestyle because you have a young child you your child fits into your lifestyle so this is why you see on a school night in Spain children out walking having an ice cream with their mums and dads nine and ten o'clock at night you know because children are there to 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 not become a hindrance but to become something that's embraced and is built into your lifestyle and therefore they should be seen, they should be heard and they're welcome, you know. So it's a kind of different environment, I think, in terms of your mentality towards children, especially out in public. And I think yeah. we've we, we spoken about this briefly before about lockdowns and all that, but people's relationships are changing with their kids because they're understanding how much quality time they can have instead of actually just seeing it as passing on the responsibility to somebody else, whether it's child-minding or whatever else. It's having that quality time. And, and you, even talking through all this stuff, I've still got a note here that said that you'd actually done teaching for 10 to 11 years, is that right? I did, yes. So yeah. I was in I was in secondary schools like across Scotland um, for, I'm trying to think when it was 2009, I got my full GTC registration. So yeah, and uh, I left actual classrooms uh, three years ago now. So oh, an actual really? proper classroom. Because yeah. you, you were saying you're struggling, obviously, with working with kids and everything else of that mentality. And then all of a sudden you've done 10 to 11 years and that's, that's a tremendous yeah. achievement for it was, but it was a light bulb moment. Like I say, it was my, I had my first school placement as part of my PGDE was in a really rough school in Castle Milk. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get the limbs torn from my body. They're going to know that I'm a newbie. Oh my God, I can't do this. But literally first two classes, the bell rang for interval. And I was like, oh, this is it. This is where I'm supposed to be. It, it was like a proper light bulb moment. I'm meant to be here. This is what I'm supposed to do. And, and to see that in a rough school in Glasgow, that says yeah. something. <laughs> so what, what, ha what happened in those sessions then? Do you remember what made you have that light bulb moment? I think I just was in a classroom for the first time, looking at it through a teacher's eyes, not as a, not as a kid. And I realised that the, the, the kind of gift that a teacher can have to really impact and change a child's life may not be in your subject but just your interaction you have with that kid in that moment do you know and 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 it might make their day it might make them feel a little bit better about themselves they could achieve something in your class and that'd be the only thing they've achieved for that whole entire week they could just come into your room and feel welcome and safe and you know given an opportunity to be supported and I think there was just that feeling, that vibe from the teacher that I spent those first two classes with. I could see that relationship she had with them. And I thought, wow, this is this is it. This is exactly what I want to do. And the passion for your language, just fighting to try to give young people a positive first experience of language learning that hopefully they'll hold on to through their lives. You know? Yeah, that's lovely how you've described that because it's almost like you remembering that where we started it and you're sitting in Spain and hearing the people's you've had that positive language and that's that's been such a strong driver for you in terms of your career and yeah. going on and working on languages so to pass that on I think I think it's great so you, so you you made a transition into teaching and then obviously I guess kids kids come along as they do they do yeah. want us to spend a bit more time with them and obviously there's that pool both Chris and I have kind of tried to you know, we've we've got kids similar ages, but we've tried to kind of move in a similar way. And we just definitely found the nine to five wasn't for us. It is for many people, but it, it just didn't didn't suit how we wanted to to, to work. How, how have you found that transition into, I guess, non classroom based learning or typical classroom based learning? Um, and then the transition online, obviously, I know last year kind yeah. of affected loads of businesses, but like your own business would have been affected. So kids' lingo, uh, speech bubble would have been affected as yeah. well. So um, how, how did that transition manage? Do you know what I did is I kind of um, worked part-time uh, in a real job <laughs> at a school and started kids' lingo up quietly in the background because I wasn't confident enough to take that leap. And as yeah. a family, it was too much of a risk, it was too much of a financial risk for me to say goodbye to, you know, a head of department job and, and just go for it. So we did it step by step. But what became apparent in the first 12 months is that there was business out there for kids lingo. More I started with 
two preschool Spanish classes on a Saturday morning. That was it. And within six months, that was a whole morning of classes and two full days after school. Then we started working with nurseries. So I went into nurseries during the school day when my kids were at school. So um, it worked out that, you know, I was working full time again. I was in secondary school two days a week. I was in nurseries all through the day doing after school classes and then Saturday spending a whole day as well with classes. So there was no doubt in my mind when it came to that crunch point, the job that I was doing came up full time and my instinct was no, absolutely not. I wasn't enjoying being a head of department either. It's quite isolating when you get to that level. So I was quite grateful to come away. And what that meant was when the bell rang at the start and end of the day, I was there for my kids. They weren't going to after school care. They weren't having to get a taxi to granny's house by themselves. You know, they weren't in nurseries from eight to five, you know. So there was that real degree of flexibility for someone to be that present, that person there. And at the same time, I took on caring responsibilities for elderly parents as well, which is ongoing now. So they call it that sandwich generation, don't you? We've got our kids here and we've got the parents above. And yeah, so this was this was just a no brainer for me, really going into kids lingo at the time. So yeah, without a doubt, it was scary, I suppose. But um, I've not looked back. And kids lingo has opened up other opportunities. And this is where speech bubble came about. You mentioned lockdown. Yep, Do you know we had to shut down our classes instantly. Um, we lost all of our nurseries apart from one. Um, I did online classes with a nursery throughout lockdown um, so the kids were logging in from home um, and seeing all their friends while we did some Spanish together which was great and then when they went back to nurseries and we still weren't allowed in we zoomed into the nursery classroom and did it from from home to them and uh, yeah in terms of our, our private customers we maintained we managed to hold about 80 85 percent of our customer base for kids lingo we lost kids who just didn't want to sit online which is understandable but we kept it going and we actually grew in other areas we took on a lot of private tuition classes so parents who were decided to home educate they now get us in as specialist teachers for the language element of their kids education um and yeah, Speech Bubble had been running for about a year and a half. That's my own business. I taught just a couple of groups of adults at our centre here in East Clyde, And that grew during lockdown, which blew my mind. So I took on um, numerous ladies, all ladies across the UK, who now have their own section of Speech Bubble and teach adult classes, languages, so with languages. So that actually grew. Speech Bubble um expanded I went from just me and one teacher to oh, what, what do we have now um, eight or nine different teachers with their own tutors teaching adult classes so yeah it was lockdown open doors as well as closing them <laughs> yeah I mean there's something in that like here hearing you say that I can't remember the exact phrase but it's like with difficulty there's always opportunity there's always like there's this duality where yes with struggle but there's always there's always an opportunity to grow um and it sounds like you've massively grasp that like that didn't just fall in your lap that's something that you went out there and and had to and had to like actively go and get to be fair I mean you're saying that I I don't think you're going to say it, it did land on your lap <laughs> it, well, I, I, and I think you know I mean I speak to my other colleagues I remember being about year three into kids lingo and one of my other kids lingo ladies talking to me about her three-year business plan I was like what I'm like, I don't have one of them, I'm too busy, um, do you know, to write a plan. And it's the same a little bit with Speech Bubble. We went for SQA, so we have Scottish Qualification yeah. Authority accreditation, so we can put adults and students through their exams of Speech Bubble. And that was the first time I actually thought, I should probably write a business plan, and just, yeah. because they needed to see one. It has been very much that, like you say, landing in your lap. I, to this point, it has been more responsive rather than me actively seeking a business. And for that, I am truly grateful. Um, but I do have that pressure on me where I feel like there's so much more potential for kids lingo and so much more potential for speech bubble. But it is trying to manage these businesses alongside being a parent and a child looking after my own parents. So, yeah, it is. Yeah. I have a great team of people around about me, too. So it's, yeah. You're, you're laughing at me, but it has this kind of fallen into my lap. <laughs> it's, I, thought I do work my absolute socks off, but um, yeah, it's been it's been some 
roads I've gone down without actively looking for them. So, yeah. Well, I think there's something here for the listeners as well, because when you, you're saying it's reactive and stuff's landing in your lap, but when you take it right back, you were talking about basically you had your job, you didn't want to leave at that point, you tested the water first, you said, okay, I'm going to work a couple of days, don't want the full-time position, head of department, I know a few head of departments personally as well, and they said, it's like having kids, of, the, of like your teachers are like having other kids, and then you've yes. got the actual pupils themselves, so it's quite like that as well, so you tested the water, then you actually said what would be comfortable for you, then you trialled it, then you actually pulled your kids out of that kind of passing responsibility on you, took the own responsibility, and then you actually just ran with it, and one yeah. may have locked down, but the other one's fried as well, because you hear these fantastic people that have learned Mandarin and became jugglers and all this kind of stuff during lockdown. So people were looking for something totally. to do. So that's fantastic. They were. Um, and a lot of the, the speech bubble team that I have that came on board during lockdown have no intentions of ever teaching in an actual classroom. These ladies have set up their businesses in that Zoom environment and have no plans of ever taking it anywhere else. And their businesses are thriving, which is great. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's something we never covered it at the time. We kind of glossed over it, but you mentioned you're connected with Argentina, and there's a sister yeah. class like over there. I think that's amazing in terms of what Zoom's been able to allow us. We've all had enough of Zoom. We're on Zoom now, but we've all, we've all had enough of Zoom, like to a certain extent. But I think the op- the opportunity that that's given, like particularly from a language point of view, well, you can pick up on those dialects. You can understand the different variances yeah. in language. Um, like, that must be amazing. It's just so nice. And I mean, the it's to see the the feeling of accomplishment in my students and my adult students when they're asking questions and co- taking conversation pieces that we rehearse and practice in class time. And they've said these to an actual Spanish person and that person's actually understood what they've said and they're replying and they know what they're saying. And it's just this buzz. You can see it and their faces just light up and it's it's wonderful. It's great for them to actually have a as close to a real life experience of using their language skills as possible. And obviously creating these links. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I mean, I still remember when you're chatting there, I instantly go, yep, yeah, I remember the first time I ordered a baguette in France and, and someone didn't interrupt me. I was like that. Like, I, I got a cheese and ham baguette, but I was walking away, like, on cloud nine as if this was the best totally. thing ever. This, this is the best sandwich <laughs> ever. Like, just <laughs> I earned this sandwich. Do you know, this is the thing my adults message me from their, from Spain and they say, or, you know, a lady was away in Spain um, during the summer break and she texts me from Spain saying, I've just managed to get a key cut for my apartment in Spanish. And I'm so wow. proud. I just want to tell you this. And I'm like, Such a yes. specialist subject as well. Yeah. As... I know it's totally random, but she's that's not, that's not asking. to go and try it. That's not asking for your library that like you used to get taught and all this kind of That's stuff. That's it. No. Well, you, <laughs> you, you could pick up the phrase that I did in, a, in any phrase book, to be honest, but getting a key cut, I think that's a, that's a niche area there. I love that. Though. And I was going to just quickly touch upon, because we talked there in lockdown, we talked to in pupils, and I've seen some stats, I think it was in the website or something, a social media post you're putting out. They said like in lockdown one, there was 20% of students basically in schools didn't follow through with the language studies. And then it was like 50% yes. in lockdown two. And the girl that I mentor as well, she personally went through that as well. She found it quite overwhelming during the lockdown period to kind of have the stuff sent to you. And she just made a decision that I'm going to just cut French. I'm going to cut yeah. French. She enjoyed it, but she cut it. And then now that she's moved into the next year up, she's now not followed it through and she's not carrying French with her anymore. And that is, I wouldn't say that's completely due to the lockdown, but that was a big experience for her. And that's a sad thing. No, I definitely, uh, absolutely, without a doubt. I think, um, and certainly from teaching in schools as well, there is a belief that language learning is an academic subject, a bit like English or maths or something. But in reality, to learn a language properly, you have to view it as a practical subject, like tech or um, craft and design uh, and that idea, because you need that interaction and you need to be practicing that language you need to have somebody physically with you listening to you practice and speak and talk you through and support you it is not something you can do remotely whatsoever I personally am really strongly believe in that and I think a lot of people go I've been on Duolingo and now it was great fun but I still can't speak it it's because you don't have somebody beside you holding your hands and le- and supporting you in that next step. So I'm not surprised with those stats whatsoever, um, you know, because I think it is like, because it is a practical subject. It needs to be viewed that way. And certainly I know a lot of my 
counterparts who are still in school really struggled when um, during lockdown schools opened for practical subjects. So some of the senior school students were allowed back in, but they weren't allowed back in for languages and they had speaking performances to do. So it's a bit like somebody taking drama or learning a musical instrument and not being able to actually practice it in front of somebody to make sure that they have it correct. And that's what I think has probably been a real struggle for our students who maybe previously would have just stuck with their language learning, you know. Um, but it is like speaking a language is a musical instrument. It's not riding a bike. If you don't practice it, you can't just get back on it and be fluent. You, you have to be practicing it all the time. So, yeah, I'm not surprised lockdown struggled with that. So what are the main benefits then for getting your child in there early? Because obviously my children don't do languages, though Darren's does. I mean, I've looked on the website and I've seen some of the benefits. What are the benefits for children at a young age? I think so. Obviously, um, in terms of the science behind it all, um, children have a little window of opportunity between the kind of 18 months mark up until about the age of seven or eight, where language acquisition is something that's very switched on really high if you imagine the volumes turned right up on it and they're really receptive and the concept of two sets of languages coming in at that stage is not a problem for a child when you get a little bit older when you get to that 9 10 11 the second language acquisition becomes a little bit trickier the brain's not as switched on at that certain part of their brain but also what happens at that 11 age is children become more self-aware get more embarrassed and don't want to make stupid noises that French is and Spanish. Unfortunately, history in the UK, we don't start learning a language with the kids until that point. And that's the point where they're all like, I'm not saying that stupid. No, no. Do you know, and they have all that uncomfortableness, do you know, whereas you start early days, it becomes something very natural, very normal for them. And in fact, what we do with kids lingo is make it fun. We, You can't force a child to speak a language, but you can set the stage to make them want to. And that's what is, is easier when you're younger because you can play with it, you know, and have a lot of fun. But you know, apart from just learning that other language, you know, there's so much um, research out there about what language acquisition can do. Just an exposure of a little bit of a foreign language can light up lots of brain cells in other areas of your life, like creativity, problem solving, relationships, communication, empathy, and generally just telling your kids, by the way, there's another country out there and there's other cultures and other people. And I think in an era where everybody seems to be building and putting barriers in place, I won't go down that political discussion with you. <laughs> really good we time. might take you there. No. <laughs> you know, it's a great time for us to just really show our kids, you know, at a young age and make them more culturally aware that they are a global citizen and that there are other cultures out there for them to embrace and explore yeah i love i love all of that and that's all of the reasons where like i actually had a bit of guilt i want to kind of pause and maybe recognize you particularly for i guess the empathy and care when we had to stop during lockdown yeah. but jill and i personally felt the pressure of keeping that up at that time i was managing redundancy at oh, that yeah. point i was you know staff staff on furlough that I was that I was kind of managing and picking up the workload for. And it felt like, see, the guilt after pausing that for about four months or something was like, like I, I should have kept that on. That like I'm an adult. I could be, I could load that, I, I could carry that weight. What well, my kids are going through the exact same thing, but they're not as emotionally capable. Um yeah, but mm -hmm. in many ways, in many ways they actually are just as capable. Um, yeah. but that's exactly it. See, see, when we got back in, I think we were back in about August time. We were certainly on um on on Zoom. But I think even just having that like half hour of them being able to see other people and now that they're back in classrooms for the last like three, four weeks has been fantastic just seeing just their energy around it. Like they're way livelier yeah. than, than than what they were when they're watching it on the screen. So I think there's yeah. way more to it than me than just the like the language component. It's the it's the social interaction that I think the kids have just oh, been craving for. Um but yeah my my brother's always been I'm a twin brother. My brother's kind of done languages his life. He's married to a Chinese 
uh, girl and he's you know his kids both are are bilingual they speak Chinese and, and he talks to me about a bit about what you said that there's a perspective element to it and I almost look at it like a drop down in a computer where you kind of drag to like an Excel and and you've got all these different options so it's like that's a that's a animal or something okay what's the word that I want to use and the effect <laughs> that that has on your brain in terms of fire and synapses and all, all this sort of stuff is is incredible in terms of just being able to enable the child to to learn different things and to look uh-huh. at things from a different perspective so it's not just um you know you mentioned we're putting up barriers this is not just one way of thinking it actually allows us to step around that and maybe look at it from a different angle so it's not just about language yeah. it's about perspective in life in general that's maybe got a bit that's deep it. there but that's how I see it no totally and I think you were saying like earlier on about oh why learn French if I'm not going to go and live in France that's not <laughs> what it's all about Do you know it's about everything else it does for our mental well-being and developing those great muscles in our brain but it's also just an opportunity for for young people to just appreciate that their way of life their way of thinking their language their culture that's not the only way there is. And I think as adults, parents, we have a massive duty to to be instilling that open outward way of thinking with our wee ones nowadays um, because of the current, current climate that we're in politically um, and explain to them that we're not, our way of thinking isn't the only way and there's yeah. other kind of people and cultures out and there. And it's easier to get. We, we put up those cultural barriers for our kids. They don't learn it like, no one's born racist. No one's born That's a left wing or a right wing. No, like we put up those those barriers. So yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. I'm just going to bring it back a wee bit as well now. If that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Away from the you're like politics, politics. No, <laughs> no, it's fantastic, honestly. Because I'm all about so I work in brands. I'm all about tribes and followings and all this kind of stuff. So the way I see language as well, it kind of gives you an opportunity to join another tribe, another kind of. Yes. So if you go to France, you can become part of that. You mentioned, Darren, how you were in was it France or Spain and you ordered a, was it a bacon France, baguette? Yeah, she, cheese and ham. Yeah, yeah. Cheese Fromage, and ham baguette. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, was that Giroud? On you go. No, no, I'm not, I'm not going to embarrass myself. <laughs> okay, I, I started and I'm like, no. I'm... <laughs> uh, but again, it gives this is the that... self. This is the self-awareness that Louise yeah. was just talking about. Yeah. But, but that, that, yeah, you're but uncomfortable. That, but that gives you an opportunity then to join different cultures and feel that you're part of the yeah. kind of... The, like your, you mentioned your friend or one of your clients even or you got the key cut as well so automatically they feel that they're part of that culture which is fantastic and I, I think that's the thing for kids as well it gives them that confidence they could then go and live somewhere if they wanted to and Absolutely. It, gives, it, it gives you the confidence and I'm just going to just touch on something quickly Dara was talking about like how kids respond and so you and I, I seen one of your Facebook and Instagram posts I think it was I think it was maybe your daughter or son one of your children and you had them you were saying whatever language it was maybe in Spanish and they were touching their nose and touching their toes that's my son, yeah, when he was little. I thought that was so, tremendous. Yeah. yeah, well, with all of my children, um, I've always spoken as much Spanish to them at a really young age. So my youngest that you saw just sitting with me when we opened up, so she's eight months, and we can ask her to clap her hands in Spanish, and she'll do it. And if you say besos instead of give me a wee kiss, she'll make wee kissing noises because she just it's just assimilating it straight away. And... The touch on the body parts and everything, that's from the bath. So let's wash your cabeza. Let's, and it's fun. And they don't even for a minute think, hold on a minute, I'm going to drop down my Spanish menu here. And go <laughs> it's just happening. You're just subconsciously <laughs> dropping that into them. Yeah. Uh-huh, absolutely. Yeah. So, no, they've been great. And I mean, I personally, like I say, I've spoken a lot of Spanish and sang and played with my, all my kids in Spanish as much as I can when they were little. And my older kids who are at school now, they're great readers. They're, you know, their mother tongue language acquisition is fantastic. You know, they have great powers of expression and their vocabulary is insane. And I'm, I've got no doubt in my mind whatsoever that I supercharged them when they were wee. Oh. <laughs> supercharged them up before they hit school. <laughs> when I looked at some of the benefits, I think it was on the website as well, I was amazed because it talks about how your baby is a sponge at that age because you can take some stuff in. But it says... It can help them with increased problem solving, ability to focus, boost confidence, it improves their language, even in English, and it improves, mm-hmm. increases their global and cultural awareness, and even helps the parents with their self-esteem. So I'd never imagined that from just learning a language for some, such a young age, and I think that's yeah. tremendous, just for such, I mean, I especially think, your kids, Danny. 
Do you know, I think as well that, um, I mean, we have a lot of kids, particularly kind of school age kids that have joined our classes because they are not the academic or the sporty or the, the kind of outgoing, you know, rugby playing, football or swimming. They're not that. We have a lot of kids who have that lovely little personality of being perhaps more of an introvert where it's actually kind of embraced in our classes. We're loud and we're noisy and we have lots of fun, but we see these kids taking steps and you see their confidence increasing. And parents will comment on that where their children will be pre-warned before they join a class about how they're shy and how they're introverted and how they don't want. And then within a month or two, they're sitting there, even at a preschool age, saying, je m'appelle Murray. And you go, yes, you know, <laughs> and it is just one of those things that it takes that as that, like, that little tiny um, growth in other ways. Other that's ways. as far as I can go as well, je m'appelle, and that's yeah. it, to be fair. So, no, <laughs> that's, that, that's fantastic. Murray's already outskilling me. That's it. Yeah, there, I mean, it's confidence is situational as well. So it's almost recognising different opportunities. Like if you are a swimmer or you're a rugby player or whatever, like that's totally cool and you feel confident in that space, great. But you know, it doesn't have to be this kind of physical or outgoing persona to be confident. You can have yeah. confidence, can show up in different ways and it's situational. So it's almost given, you know, given young people, whether it's, you know, infants right through to, to young adults and, and adults themselves actually recognising that their confidence can show up in different places. And that's absolutely cool. It's, it's not about being confident or not being confident because yeah. we're all confident in different spheres. So, so that's yeah. It. And you, you seem to be saying as well, it seems to be that kind of more organic in a way where you're getting them comfortable with the words as well, making it playful. Because uh, obviously you're seeing that stuff in the bath and they're repeating it to you. And I'd seen those tips that you can even make it fun by going up the stairs, making them count by going up the stairs. So it's all about play as well at that very young age, which is great. It is. It is. My yeah, kids do that. They... <laughs> oh, do they up the stairs? They do. So they do. So Lauren counts. There was 20 steps up to um, our old nursery in uh, Thornley Bank. So yeah, so and both Murray and Lauren can count to twenty in French because of those uh-huh. because of the steps and like you said, it's not like it's like why don't you do do it in French today on français and and they'll go on do it and it just rolls off and to them it's just fun. It's climbing steps and speaking as they're going. It's not I'm yeah. going to embed this learning in my head. Uh-huh. Yeah, but children at that age they are programmed to to learn through play-based learning. That's why we have play-based curriculum in the nurseries and in the kind of first couple of years in the infant school, but it's all about play-based learning. Um, so we just apply that to kids' lingo. And to be fair, that's the, the philosophy behind Speech Bubble as well, as I try to make our Speech Bubble classes really fun and really engaging. So our adults feel a little bit less closed and uh, scared and they join in and they play and they have fun and we laugh, do you know? I mean, we play grammar pong, do you know, like those beer cups that we play <laughs> in. We, do you know, it's these sort of things and it's because adults have a predisposed idea of what language learning was like from school and they come along to speech bubble and they realise that's not what we're doing. So a lot of the philosophy from teaching kids, I apply with my 70 year olds, do you know, that way and we learn that way too because even as adults, we love a laugh and we learn better when we're in that environment where it's a lot more fun. You're right. I've got a pre. I've got a memory from learning French. We had a French teacher come over as well, but even that's a different story. Uh, but it was we had to basically put on the headphones. It was a tape deck, and you press yeah. play, and that was it. And you just had to repeat it, and then you get an assessment straight after it. And we had this lovely lady, Madame de Paul, that came over. She was an exchange teacher. But the problem was she didn't really fully understand English at the accent, like you were saying, or the Glasgow accent. Yeah. So when she was asking you stuff and. French and you were repeating it back and you were answering it back in English as well she didn't fully understand it or grasp it because she was only there for a year and yeah, it took, it took uh-huh. her probably four months to kind of get up to speed and then that was kind of too late already for some of the kids. Really? I mean we had some really great times with Spanish friends of ours that came and did their year and in, in Glasgow and we met we'd already met them in Spain because we were there the year before and they were coming back to Glasgow and they would ask us words like how do you say whatever and we would give them that word and they would repeat it back to us with a Glasgow accent. And we'd be like, no, that's no, that's not it. And they're like, no, but I am saying it the way you talk. And I'm like, oh, is that what we sound like? Oh, my God. And it's just like, ah, because they're coming back to us with the same accent as well. And I'm like, oh, God, yeah, we are really all, all, all these Spanish students getting failed for their English. Because <laughs> they're speaking with a Glasgow well, accent. What about was that Glasgow? All oh, right, OK, OK. That's it. I mean, my mate, uh, one of our long-term friends, Jaime, who lives in Spain, 
he works in the ferry business and when he's in America and stuff, he talks to people, they're like, what is going on with that guy's accent? Because <laughs> he still has this Glaswegian accent when he's speaking English. It's really strange. It's really weird to hear a Spanish guy go, I. <laughs> it's like, oh. I, lo- I, lo- I love that. My-, my dad's a Londoner and he's lived up here for most of his life. He still calls people Lassie and Jock. And his Scottish oh accent God. is terrible, terrible. So I can appreciate oh, yes. that as well. Okay. Oh. Well, well, let's like bring it up to in terms of where you are now. You touched on it earlier that like you've got these plans for you'd love to be able to grow it, and you're kind of trying to balance that with you know being a mum and you know mm-hmm. being being at cent holding your family at the centre. Um, like where where are you at with that? What do you think the next sort of five years will will be? Where do you hope your businesses will move to? What have you got? coming down the pipeline you're asking me to you're asking me to make a business plan here Dan, and I'm <laughs> told I don't do business plans <laughs> or, 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 or just dream where, where would you where would you like it to go I, don't, I, 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 I agree though on the whole business plan front I think this is something that's refreshing and I'm glad that you've said that is we've spoken to so many business owners Chris haven't we that and hardly any of them I can't I'm trying to think if any have actually said you know what we had a really strong business plan before we went and done things it's all kind of yeah, there was maybe this opportunity or half door open here. So I went through there and then there was another opportunity over here. And then I went over here. We're all just kind of winging it to one extent or another. Some of us are yeah. winging it a bit more planned than others, but we're all kind of winging it, I think. Yeah. So, um, uh-huh. so, yeah. I think, you know, personally at the moment, um, sometimes I feel really frustrated personally because um, managing businesses, which I'm so blessed that they are busy and they are growing but trying to to feel like I am 100% managing that and 100% being there for my young family and for my mum and constantly you'll know it yourselves just pulled in opposite directions so on a business side of things at the moment I'm feeling really frustrated but I am aware that in a year or two you know when my youngest goes to nursery I'm going to again have a lot more free time to dedicate so I remember listening to one of your earlier podcasts, Aaron, and I think it was you talking about working in the business and working on the business. Yeah. And there's a difference there. I'm very much working in it. And I feel that that's how it's going to be for a wee while. And then working on it will come when I actually get a little bit more free time and um, can focus on formalising certain things for Speech Bubble and growing it a little bit bigger too. Um, We would love to be able to um, support... Uh, schools in terms of their modern languages provision as well and allow students who are in their fifth and sixth year to do their advanced languages which often due to staffing constraints can't we can't do that in schools I, I myself wanted to do advanced higher Spanish and was told there's not enough demand not enough teachers you can't do it so it would be great for us to maybe explore that route um, as well as just growing geographically for speech bubble would be great in terms of kids lingo I'm we are just back in after lockdown. So we are currently, as I speak, starting to get back in touch with our nurseries and growing that part side of our business again. And I have a great team of people around about me, great teachers, um, great tutors, great administration support staff. And for a temporary period, yeah, it's going to be a team job rather than a, me trying to keep all the plates spinning at one time. <laughs> It does sound like you've got a lot on your plate as well, and it's good to actually be able to recognise that you are working in your business and not working on the business as well, because if you're so yeah. busy as well and you've got, like you say, your youngest who's going to be going to nursery soon, you've got, you're looking after your mum, you've got your two businesses as well, that's a lot on your plate as well. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's good to be able to recognise that, which is fantastic. And it yeah, sounds like, oh, sorry, you go, Dan. All I was going to say is there's, there was something in that, and maybe how I position the question as well, Louise, that, they're almost it's like oh what's your growth what's your grand plan for that and sometimes it's like having the self-awareness to recognize where you are and having the patience to go no I'm exactly where I need to be like right now yeah. and I'm Live, living living yeah. in the moment yeah Li- living in the just moment and I'm going to let it tick over yeah. just ticking nicely yeah. over in the background and yeah n- nothing's it. nothing's like there's not anything wrong with that like that is still growth because it's you being there and you're, you're you're growing and you're being there for your family as you need it just now and you're also being there for your existing customers and continuing to serve them um yeah. which is not 
you know, yes, you need to grow, but you want to be able to look after everyone around you who's part of your family, whether business or, or in life. So but otherwise, um, absolutely. It's just about getting that that balance right. And sometimes balance is great. That work life balance is just tickety boo. And other times it's just carnage. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's I it wouldn't have it any other way. I'd much rather be doing this and having opportunity to grow something that is mine and to, to have my own business rather than being, was it working for the man, as they say, and my yeah. kids being in care all day in nurseries and after school and wrapper, that was just, that was a different type of carnage that I did not like. And this way, I know that I might be chocka, but at three o'clock, I'll be at the school for my kids when they come out. And that's what's important. But, but there must be something else in there as well. So there's all that, but then you get these text messages at the blue that says, I've just ordered a key cup in Spanish. And that must just give you complete joy and happiness. It used to be happy dance, absolutely. Or, you know, Shannon will message me and say, Murray spoke out today. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I'm going to go find a certificate and post it to them. They need to, you know, and it, is, it makes it all worthwhile. It really does. Because at the end of the day, languages is what I've only ever been about and if I can help people have that sense of achievement in their lives related to language learning then it's all the, the carnage is worth it definitely <laughs> yeah. no I mean you can tell that I, I think anyone who's listening to this or watching this will will absolutely get that in spades in terms of your enthusiasm and yeah it's great that you've had that from such an early age and it's been such a consistent presence for you kind of throughout throughout your life as well which is great because that that often doesn't doesn't happen for some so um yeah it's great to have had you on and to be able to explore that um yeah. in terms of where people can reach you um what's the best what's the best way to do so if they're an adult looking to get in in into language it's french and spanish isn't it mainly is there anything so, yeah, else? french uh, french and spanish um there's an efl course uh, coming up as well for speech bubble so it's speech bubble languages yeah if you have a little google for us you'll find us speech bubble languages um and there could be local tutors depending where you're listening from across the uk but um, yeah, come through to us on Speech Bubble Languages and we'll definitely find a home for anyone who's willing to dabble in language learning in a bit of a fun, relaxed way. Yeah. And Kids Lingo, you're, you're still based Glasgow South area? We are. Yeah. So Kids Lingo is a national uh, franchise. So yep. there's hundreds of us across the UK. And my specific region is Kids Lingo Glasgow South. So you'll find us on there as well. And I can testament, um, I, I know you mentioned Shannon there as well, but I think just the energy that, and just the consistency showing up each week over lockdown, I just, I want to just pause, I guess, and and say thank you, I guess, to you and the team as well, just for yeah. being able to do that and show up and even just manage some of those difficulties when I had to pause that for, for a yeah. while, our own membership. It's like still being there and just recognising like, that's okay as a parent, Um yeah. And just, as I said, the main thing, continuing to show up week in, week out when things are difficult um, I mean, to, likewise, be there, to be there you know, for our kids. So. We we needed you guys too, you know, lockdown, everything shut down. And I know certainly speaking for myself and my team for Kids Lingo, logging on and seeing all those wee smiley faces every week just kept us going as well. As though as hard as it was to totally revolution, turn the business from live to online, it, showing up and seeing all our customers and our wee faces there every week was great for us too. So yeah, we owe it to our customers too. Cool. Well, how, how do we say goodbye and thank you in Spanish? Adios y gracias. Au revoir. Adios, Adios y gracias. Merci. 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 As always, thank you so much for listening to the Pop Pod this week. If you'd like to leave a review or share the podcast with others, then that'd be awesome. You'll find us on Instagram at the Pop Pod, and on Facebook we have a community group called Purpose to Progress that anyone can join. And we'll be back every Monday with a new episode, but until then, stay on purpose, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>